All right, Mick, thank you for making time. <laughs> Happy to be here with you, Naveen. Thanks for, for setting this up. All right, so we'll get started. Um, my name is Naveen Gupta. I am the Senior Vice President and Division Head for the Home and Hospice Division at Matrix Care. Welcome again to another episode of the Matrix Care podcast, aka the post-acute point of view. This is our very first episode for 2021. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Mick Farrell, the CEO of ResMed. As many of you know, ResMed is the world's leading connected health company and the parent organization of the brands that you are very familiar with, Matrix Care, Bright Tree, and Healthcare First. Mick, we are very honored to have you on our very first episode. Happy New Year and welcome. Happy New Year to you, Naveen, and uh, thanks for setting up these, uh, these great webinars. And I look forward to uh, having a little chat to you and a chat to all the great uh, attendees that are uh, going to be listening in. That's great, Mick. Mick, we um, certainly want to talk about ResMed and ResMed's origin. I, I love those stories. And we want the, uh, you know, we want to start by get, you know, allowing our audience to get to know you a little bit better. I remember our first interaction was almost two years ago. It was right after the acquisition. And as, you know, sort of first meeting, first impressions are formed, uh, you know, you came across certainly as someone, you know, very personable, very curious, great listener. I also remember reading this article, uh, a top CEO rebooted his life to refresh his company. And in that article, you know, you talk about just sort of reprioritizing family life, spirituality, meditation, spending time with your wife and children. And so again, just very curious to understand your overarching, I've heard you speak about the intersection of altruism, you know, leaving the world a better place and profit. So talk to us a little bit about that, uh, Mick. What motivates you? What drives you? What inspires you? Yeah, Naveen, well, it's a, it's a good question. I'm glad we're sort of starting on a philosophical question, right? Often we just get yeah. straight into the business, and I appreciate that uh, because we're people first, and then we're business people second. Uh, healthcare is a pretty unique space uh, for us, Naveen, and you and I have spent, you know, most of our careers in, in this area, and it's unique because you're able to overlap altruism, which is doing good for others without expecting any material sort of earthly return to yourself, along with um, a business world where business worlds, you know, the for-profit worlds are driven by, by profits. But you can look for the overlap of the two. And when you look for the overlap of the two, they're far more sustainable, beneficial, and long-term businesses. And so it's good for the business side, just thinking business strategy, but it's also good for the soul. You feel a lot better when you have spent the whole day helping people in our context, helping people sleep better, helping people breathe better, and helping people live better lives. I've sort of, you know, that um, rebooted my life. Yes. It's funny how journalists can take your conversation and turn it, but I like the way she she sort of took that story, that, you know, discussion we had and turned into that story about reboot. It really was. I mean, I found myself, I'm a chemical engineer with an MBA, and I, I sort of pursued that world of success equals money, power, and, and all those elements. And I have to say that, you know, I, I am I'm the CEO of a public S&P 500 company, but I sit back and I go, well, what are my jobs? And my jobs are really simple. I'll summarize it this way, Naveen, we'll get into the business yeah. discussion. You know, my first job is to be a child of God. And that mm. means, yes, I pray every morning, I pray every night, and I understand that I'm part of an eternal whole and I'm mortal and I'll leave this earth and then, and then I'll go to, to an eternal home. So I'm child of God, one. Number two that I am a husband to Lisette and a father to Camille and James. That's my second most important job in the world. After child of God, the only one after God is my wife and my kids, right? Uh, and, then, and then the third um, job of mine is to be a friend to many. You know, there's a lot of uh, poetry and, and songs and literature written around. You can probably count your true friends on one hand. Those yeah. will come when you're truly in need. I, I, I want to be a friend to many more, but understand who those those true friends are. So that's the third job. My fourth job is to be uh, my career. My vocation is to be CEO of ResMed. And, and it's funny when I've laid those out, I've been asked some, you know, publicly by shareholders, gosh, you know, we, we're really your fourth priority. I'm like, well, are you more important than God or my wife? You know, <laughs> um, and the fifth job, uh, Naveen, is actually to give back uh, to my community and, and uh, through nonprofits. And so I'm on the board of, 
Rady Children's Hospital, um, the number one children's hospital uh, in Southern California, takes care of all uh, kids, um, you know, under tw under 21 f from all of San Diego County, and also I'm on the board of Father Joe's Villages, which is a, a homeless shelter, takes care of about 5,000 people uh, with food, shelter, warmth, love, faith and hope um for people in downtown san diego where we have about eight thousand homeless but yeah they're my five jobs that's sort of my summary of my life philosophy in five minutes you know make it's, it's inspiring to have you have so much clarity number one number two is you know you are able to connect your vocation with a larger purpose and you know it's refreshing it's authentic it's inspiring and uh you know i've heard tidbits of that in the past and i know that's been very appealing to me personally as i hear your story and, I, and I'm sure it's going to resonate with people, you know, Resmen and its mission and how it connects to sort of a larger purpose. Um, you know, founding stories are so inspirational to me. I remember when I was in college as a young kid reading The Making of Microsoft by Bill Gates and the stories about these guys coding away right through the night and, you know, the cleaners come in the morning and they find these people lying on the floor. You know, you have stories like Shoe Dog from Phil Knight, uh, you know, even, even Salesforce right behind the cloud. ResMed is a spectacular company. And uh, first of all, congratulations on that Wall Street Journal and the Drucker Institute recognition. That was fantastic. I met 31 billion in market cap, earnings per share, 24%, uh, revenue, 12% uh, growth, total shareholder return in three years, 155%, just simply outstanding. Yet, you know, not a lot of uh, people really know about the origin, about, about you know, how did Resmen really get started? And, you know, your dad, Dr. Peter Farrell, please tell us the story. <laughs> well, uh, Naveen, it's, it's, it's a long story or, or a short story. So I'll try to give you, you know, the, uh, the Mark Twain said, you know, sorry, I read you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to try to, to, to sure. use a little uh, summarization here. But um, I mean, the short form is that, that uh, yeah, my, my dad, um, Dr. Peter Farrell, was uh, vice president of R&D for Baxter Healthcare in Asia Pacific. Mm -hmm. And um, he was running about 30 to 40 different research projects. I'd call them sort of early to mid-stage research projects and, and minority investments and um, sort of early, early applied research work for Baxter that, that could eventually turn into big products that the Baxter sure. marketing and sales muscle could take to global markets. And uh, when there was a decision made in about 1988 that Baxter would pull all R&D from Europe and Asia all back to, to North America and they were going to center all R&D just in one little location center. Seems crazy in this global Zoom world that someone would do that, but some probably, you know, Harvard MBA made that decision in 1988. And what was interesting about that was my dad was sitting there like, okay, you're shutting us down, fine. You know, we're all smart people. We're going to get, get new jobs. But look, there's a couple of projects here that are really exciting. These should go in your, you know, uh, division in the hospital and this one you know should really be in your home care division and they're like no look that that breathing idea it's not going to fly we don't think it's going to go and so he got together with a group a very small group of investors and for 1.25 million Australian dollars in angel funding they bought the technology and the rights to um, CPAP technology which mm. was invented uh, by Colin Sullivan in 1981 uh, Lancet publication University of Sydney but, you know, seven years later here, it was just starting to get some clinical, you know, momentum, if you like. And, and they didn't believe it, didn't buy it. And, yeah, as you said, 1.25 million in Australian dollars, which is less than a billion US. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, 30, 30 years later is worth whatever you said, 30, $31 billion today on market cap, $3 billion in revenues growing, double digits. And, but more important than any of that, and, and we're going to get to this, and it relates to the philosophy part yeah you know we went from changing maybe five lives in colin sullivan's lab uh, of which all five patients you know my dad met and all the researchers met and you personally through to these last 12 months combined with bright tree matrix care and all our sleep apnea copd and asthma work worldwide propeller and so on we changed 115 million lives in the last 12 months yes 15 million got a, a hardware medical device or full mask system and over 100 million were taken care of with digital solutions to keep them happy and healthy outside the home and i, I just look at that and say that's incredible, you know, and internally we get people sort of questioning like, oh, that, that origin, that, that first, you know, patient whose life was changed and, you know, that CPAP saved their job, saved their marriage, saved their life. 
how can we scale that? And, you know, we've gone yeah. from one to, to 15 million on that. And I, I have personal friends who I refer through to therapy. I'm not the best referral marketing one, but we're all salespeople. We do that. But when I have a friend, a fishing buddy or someone at a dinner party and, and they come back, you know, a year later or three months later, I just get these random hugs, Naveen. And there's wow. not many jobs where <laughs> the CEO or the head of a division like HHP, like you are, get hugs from your customers. In our industry, it's that beautiful feeling that you really did save someone's job, save someone's marriage, save someone's life by giving them the gift of breath the gift of sleep and the gift of good care outside the hospital. And so that's the origin story. But, you know, I, I'm more excited about not the last 30 years. I'm more excited about the next three, five, 10 years because the clock speed on our industry is picking up as we get into digital health. Yeah, Mick, and I'm going to talk about, about that in a second. But I love that. I mean, it's inspiring. About how did it all start and what really happened? There. I know today, ResMed, you know, as you said, helping folks with sleep apnea, COPD, other chronic respiratory diseases, you know, as, as part of the story, I understand at one point, your dad questioned your double degree from MIT, uh, you know, because you weren't entirely bullish about resident. I don't know if I've got it right or not, or you were just being a difficult child. I don't know which one, which part of it is true. But Probably since both. Become, <laughs> but since you've become CEO, you know, revenue has doubled, you know, 3 billion. Um, resident stock is roughly up. 300%, right? If you compare against benchmark like S&P, almost 3X. So it was back to strategy, the strategy about touching 250 million lives by 2025. So, and, and you started talking about that a little bit. Summarize that for us a little bit for this audience and how far along are we in that journey? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. And, and to, to that point where, uh, you know, my dad said, gosh, those scholarship people at that fellowship that paid for your degree in chemical engineering, your degree, your MBA from MIT wasted the money was when I was, I was sort of a little arrogant, you know, I was a whatever, a 30 year old, recent graduate from MIT, I was working in biotech industry for a company called Genzyme, now part of Sanofi, but a big biotech company in Boston at the time. And I was pretty arrogant in the biotech area. I'm like this little med tech thing, this little reverse vacuum cleaner that forms a pneumatic stent in your airway. That's not complex. That's not curing Gaucher's disease. That's not changing the world with biotech. But what was interesting was as I analyzed it further and actually used that engineering degree and that MBA to analyze what, what does this do? This isn't just a pneumatic stent that keeps an airway open. This is a device that changes lives. You know, going back to what we're saying that, that truly, if you, if you turn someone who was having you know, 15 episodes, which is called moderate sleep apnea, up to 29 episodes, still called moderate sleep apnea, mm -hmm. 29 episodes of suffocation per hour of sleep. Can you think about that, right? 30, if, if it was 30, that's every two minutes of sleep, yeah. you wake up and yeah. then you don't know it. And that happens all night. It's like your bed partner shoving a pillow on your face and holding it down for 10 seconds every two minutes. And you take that away you not only improve their life, they wake up refreshed and they feel better and, and they're sleeping better. You improve their cardiovascular system. You improve their diabetic system, their, their, their uh, insulin response system. You improve outcomes that change. Uh, you improve their chances to survive from solid cell tumor cancer by eliminating the hypoxia, which wow. creates a Petri dish for forming cancer cells and solid cell. So all those concomitant uh, disease states that we can improve by getting rid of the hypoxia, getting rid of the, the disrupted sleep and, and giving the gift of um, a sleep and breath back, change the person's life. But look, yeah, to your question about how we're going to scale to our pretty ambitious goal of changing yeah. 250 million lives by 2025, that is a big goal. But I look at it this way, and, and my dad always said, you know, we're lacing our shoes for the marathon. So everyone, you know, this is a big, long race. Don't, whatever we're doing today, we're just lacing our shoes for the marathon. I now say 30 years later, we're in mile one of the marathon. Wow. But the race has changed from three decades ago. Three decades ago, it was make the device smaller, quieter, more comfortable and get rid of ignorance. You know, educate everybody on the importance of good sleep, sure. on the importance of, of good health, you know, cardiovascular nutrition and sleep health. I think our challenge now is the awareness is much higher the challenge is finding a path to have end-to-end -end digital solutions that can help people take care of themselves. What you're seeing in medicine today is people are not just going on WebMD and Googling all their diseases and thoughts. That's not really the, the, the path to it. The path is like of all the potential things that I have, what can I get treated for easily and effectively? That's really good therapy and peer reviewed and so on. So it's guiding a consumer through the path and then helping a doctor interact with that consumer on that path. And that's what's going to get us to the 250 million lives that we can change. 
by 2025. And, and, and if you just look at it this way, <clears throat> our three core markets, uh, sleep apnea, COPD and asthma on the medical side, there's 936 million people worldwide who suffocate every night clinically wow. with sleep apnea. There mm-hmm. are 380 million people worldwide, and I think this is an underestimate, who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung mm-hmm. disease of significant consequence, stage one, two, three, or four. And then there's 340 million people worldwide who have asthma, difficulty breathing through uh, constriction of the upper airway and or lungs. That together is over 1.5 billion people. That's 20% of the 7.5 billion people on the planet, yeah. one in every five people you meet can get, uh, uh, imp- their life can be improved by ResMed. So I almost look at it and say 250 million lives by 2025, you know, it's good compound annual growth rate of whatever, 15, 17% from 115 to, to 20, uh, to, to 250 by 2025. But I say that's maybe not ambitious enough because if we've got 1.5 billion lives to change, only changing a quarter of a billion of them uh, in the next five years, maybe Naveen, we need to pick up the rate of our home health and hospice, our, our ability to scale that, our ability to scale our HME solutions, and our ability to scale our sleep apnea, COPD, and asthma solutions. Well, big, that's great perspective. I think that's the first time I've heard about it. So we're talking about 250 million, and that itself can seem like you know it's a big goal for us. While at the same time, if you look at the larger pool of the number of people we're yet to really get to and really help. It really puts it in perspective, really to your point that we should be, you know, maybe be more aggressive because ultimately I think you connected the dots. It's it's about health, but health again tied to just better, better quality of life, better outcome for them as well. Uh, so that brings me to to ResMed SaaS. Uh, we had Raj on last month, and thanks to him for, for being able to, to suggest having you on as well. And um, ResMed SaaS, you know, you know, grew by almost 30% in the in the last fiscal. Um, you know, it's becoming a pretty significant part of the overall resume portfolio, almost 12%, 350 million in revenue. So again, I was just curious, I asked Raj this question as well, I'd love to get your point of view. So what was it about sort of, was it more about diversifying what resume was doing or was it more about the feeling that you know, here we do have a challenge and, and ResMed is, is able to disrupt and transform the out of hospital space? Yeah, both of the above is, is the answer, the short answer. But the, the longer answer is that, look, we, we've been in software since 1989. We've had embedded software inside our CPAP devices from day one. And when we created the first auto titrating CPAPs, and I think it was 1991, we had uh, embedded software that was doing closed feedback loops to look at your upper airway and adjust pressure up or down um, automatically uh, with, with the Autoset technology in those early 90s. And then we created, I think, 19, uh, 1994, we, we launched the first Chainstokes out, out, um uh, breathing algorithm, uh, the Autoset CS, which had a far more complex uh, breathing algorithm for really adaptive ventilation as able to to look at a very complex crescendo decrescendo breathing um, um, situations that the body can get into in certain types of heart failure and other complex sleep apnea and and treat the patient but we got into external software probably in the mid 90s uh, where we started to have sort of pc based software that could take the data from our cpap and apap and bi level devices and help a clinician analyze for that patient you know and we sort of started to get into cloud cloud data i'd say in the early 2000s and we were sort of experimenting in this space and even, you know, outsourcing some cloud development to sort of India software companies like Infosys and others. But I think what we, when we really jumped into software was when we realized that by liberating the data to the cloud and analyzing across multiple patient groups, you can really do, do a couple of things. You can improve the adherence of that individual patient. You can, you can work out how to coach and interact an individual patient to drive up their adherence. And you can lower the cost of setting a patient up on CPAP significantly. And just to give some round numbers on this, our digital data now is able to improve adherence from you know, peer-reviewed data in the mid 2000s, 50, 60% adherence. Like any pharmaceutical yeah. prescription, any CPAP basic prescriptions, 50, 60% adherence. We're able to get that up to 87% plus. You know, that's from the peer-reviewed published data with Kaiser Permanente. Almost nine out of 10 people using that mask yeah. every night. And we're able to lower the labor cost of setting a patient up on, on ResMed care with all the digital solutions by 50%. So that was just a hypothesis when we bought Umbian, which was the company that Raj was was CEO of in 2012. And that was the start of it. And I'll call that the 
not for profit <laughs> cloud software because we basically had this great cloud software that was really a cost center was doing these great things but didn't drive any any internal uh, revenue or profit but it, it helped people adhere and we thought it would lower costs over time turns out that was a great bet because it actually has scaled now we have uh, we have over 12 million 100% cloud connectable devices on people's bedside tables around the world and we now have over three uh, a seven and a half billion nights of medical data wow. in the cloud, sleep apnea, COPD and asthma that we're able to, on a de-identified basis with privacy, cybersecurity and interoperability as absolute fundamentals needed there. But we're able to do those things, improve adherence, lower costs and really change, change the basis of future of research and, and how this industry will progress. But in those early days, and as we got to, to look at something like Brighttree, that was really our first foray into saying, why don't we look at, software as a service where there is a, a revenue model directly associated with the software. And we've been using Brighttree software and actually buying uh, market share data from Brighttree as, a, as a, um, an annual basis. I was actually running the Americas and the marketing team. And so I would write the checks every quarter to, to the Brighttree team buying <laughs> the market share data for, you know, Alabama or for, you know, Florida or for whatever, because we were, you know, launched a new product and we're doing a new experiment in marketing, wanted to see what the, the market share return was from that. Um, but their, their software was far more complex than that. But as we looked at it and we thought about, okay, will we go from just, you know, software cloud software enabling hardware, will we do what I call a reverse Amazon, right? So Amazon, big software company, who at the time wasn't so big and decided to have 100% connectivity of the Kindle to drive more digital book sales. So software sure. company getting into hardware to drive more software sales. ResMed was a hardware company, smaller, quieter, more comfortable systems than anyone else and sleep apnea, CBD and asthma. But we created 100% connectivity on our AirSense 10 and said, we're going to use the software to drive more medical sales, medical hardware sales. And that was the play at first. Brighttree was our first foray where we said, actually, why don't we see if the software itself can be a profit center, improve efficiencies and help uh, all HMEs become more efficient and, uh, and provide uh, capabilities for our industry because it's got to scale to take care of all these hospital patients. At the time we bought Brighttree, our market cap wasn't 30 billion, it was 8 billion. And we invested $800 million in buying Brighttree. So that was 10% of the farm, yeah. Naveen. So think yeah. about that. that. That would today be a $3 billion acquisition, but, which yeah. we're not looking at right this moment during COVID, but that could be something that would be hugely transformed. It'd have to be hugely transformational for the, yeah. for the company. So. When I presented that to the board, I have to tell you, there was a lot of skepticism. It was like, well, ResMed's done hardware really well. We win on that. We've done embedded software really well. And we've done this sort of early foray in cloud software for adherence and a lot, but you guys can't get into SaaS. That's going to be really difficult. Well, I think that experiment five years on, you know, this year <laughs> will be five years with Brighttree. We've grown incredibly well on Brighttree. And now, you know, we obviously bought uh, Healthcare First and then Matrix Care. And, and we've created, I think, the world's leading, uh, we're the world's leading strategic player in out of hospital software. And I think we have the right to win. I think we have the right to roll together a whole bunch of plays because we can bring cybersecurity, we can bring privacy, we can bring world class uh, interoperability, if you like, to liberate the data and, and you know, allow patients to have access to their own data and share it with their doctor and so on. But I think we can also have a unique possibility to provide seamless end-to-end -end digital care for age in place seniors and for people who are going from hospital to the home and want to be taken you know, great care of in the home. But Naveen, that's what your customers do all day, every day. Yes. Our job, I think, is to help them do it better and, and to provide systems that just get better every month and, and have that capability to do so. You know, Mick, the, 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 we, we talk about the ResMed advantage, but I mean, even within our own base, et cetera, what, what ResMed, the capabilities having uh, having you talked about cybersecurity, you talked about just even just strategic focus, patient access, being unable to understand patient flow, uh, and also more importantly, the disruption. You know, Resmed was able to do with with connectedness, essentially with education, with patient engagement. There's so much that Resmed has done in terms of just being able to handle chronic conditions, and that being able to benefit even our side of the house as we look at out of hospital space. Mick, one of the one of the questions we get, we get asked, uh, you know, pretty pretty often is uh, folks understand obviously 
right tree matrix care healthcare first. It's cer certainly you know leaders within those sub segments, um, and you know you've talked about you know earning our right. Where where are some of the synergistic sort of value propositions that you see between sort of the ResMed core business and the out of hospital space? Yeah, well, look, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting area, and um, I, I think. I mean, obviously, yeah, the, the, the synergies that you talked about are really cost synergies, if you like, you know, having sure. chief information and security officer across the group, having cloud-based management of AWS and Azure and all that across the system and having interoperability and understanding that. Yes. I think another thing we bring to the party is a global nature. We sell in 140 countries worldwide, whereas Bright Tree and Matrix Care and Healthcare first sell in 50 states, but one country. And, and so I think there's this huge opportunity for us to look at, at global markets. And I think that's uh, a skill set that ResMed brings to the table. But in terms of the synergy back to the core business, if you like, yeah. um, look, I, I look on Bright Tree, you know, world leader in home medical equipment, SaaS, right? I mean, absolutely number one market leader and provides incredible value. Um, they're also our customers. We have, you know, 4,500 ResMed customers sell our sleep apnea, our COPD um, products to, to the market and to patients. And so I think it, it not only enhances the ResMed brand to be there, not only as a hardware provider, but also a software solutions provider. But there are synergies back. I mean, the early one I was talking about that I was buying market share data, that's now an internal transfer between the marketing team and the others. We still value it for Brighttree, but we understand the value of that market share data coming through. Far more beyond that, I look on this and say, well, you know, let, let's look at matrix care. Let's look at home health and hospice. How many people do you think in a skilled nursing facility or in home health or in hospice or even, you know, private duty home care, life plan communities, senior living, how many undiagnosed and untreated sleep apnea patients do you think are there? And how many undiagnosed and untreated COPD patients are there? And how many undiagnosed and or untreated uh, adult onset asthma patients are in that patient population? I think it's an incredibly high opportunity. Now, we haven't jumped in and just said, wow, let's go and, you know, set up the, you know, the front page of, of HHP is going to be screened for sleep apnea, screened for COPD. But I think it's a value-added service that will really help as we screen for many chronic diseases, including uh, sleep apnea and COPD, that will help the core business continue to grow, but also help uh, a person uh, and or a, a person running a business across skilled nursing facilities, home health and hospice. Because if you have an untreated sleep apnea patient or worse, an untreated COPD patient in your population, they're gonna be frequent flyers back to the hospital. They're gonna have increased chronic diseases and all the sequelae I talked about earlier from the suffocation and the, the lack of good breathing that, that come for untreated uh, respiratory uh, disorders. So that's just the simple synergy that it can provide. But I think, oh, the, yeah, I, I think the reach to global markets, the synergy back to those core chronic diseases. I think also the last thing I'll say Naveen before, before your next question is that, um, one thing we've started to do at ResMed is we've realized, you know, you're not a patient with sleep apnea. You're not a patient with COPD. You're not a patient with asthma. You're a person, right? You're Naveen Gupta. You might have sleep apnea and COPD, but our job is to liberate those data, to treat you not like, frankly, Facebook and, and Google and some other consumer tech companies do as a, as a product to be sold, but to treat you as a person to be valued and that you're private data is yours but if you choose to want to have your doctor have access to it and choose to combine it with your diabetes data from Dexcom or your cardiovascular data from your Medtronic or or um, or Boston Scientific pacemaker then you now have a digital uh, um, capability to share with your doctor that could provide better care for you long term and I think the unlocking of that sort of synergistic value from out of hospital care, chronic diseases with sleep apnea, COPD, but also through our partnerships with Verily and with directly with a number of um, other players in the, in the market and globally, we may be able to bend the curve of chronic disease. So, so ResMed stands for respiratory medicine. I think it actually really stands for residential medicine as well. And wow. residential medicine means medicine where you live. 
And that's why home medical equipment, that's why skilled nursing facilities, that's why home health and hospice, that's why uh, private duty home care, and that's why senior living and life plan communities are, are integral to what we can do. Because right at the moment, healthcare costs 20% of the US GDP. Mm. It's like 19.6, let's call it 20. One in every $5 in our economy is spent on healthcare and healthcare costs are growing faster than the GDP. That's not a sustainable value proposition. We have to lower acuity, lower costs, allow people to get great health care where they live, at their home. And that's what I think ResMed does better than anybody else. And that's why I think combined with our SaaS and our core medical device business, we're pretty uniquely situated to be able to, to achieve this pretty, pretty tough goal to keep people out of hospital in the home and happy and healthy. You know, make the best way to say it, I think the way you've described it is you've almost articulated matrix care strategy. <laughs> it is keep people in the home, right? Uh, prevent them from having to go, you know, get readmitted back into having an acute episode. But the point about the overlap, right? It's, it's a person, right? Um, when we talk about 1.25 billion people, I know that's worldwide, but certainly here, here in the US as well, the, 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 the number of people with at least one chronic condition in senior population is in the 70s, it's 70% or more. Two is almost in the 80s. So that overlap exists. And then the mission is, is sort of unified in what we want to do. So I really appreciate this, Mick. This is very, very helpful. Thank you again for making time uh, for us. And I know this is going to really serve the audience. Well, great, Naveen. Thank, thanks for having me on. And, and one, thing, one thing I'll leave everyone with is the future of, of the 7.5 billion nights of data is to, you know, everyone talks about big data, but the important thing is actual information. How can we use artificial intelligence, machine learning, machine intelligence to create simple uh, uh, correspondence and interactions with customers who run out of hospital care or individual persons, patients, to help them improve care? That's the future. The future is digital. And I think between you and all your customers at Matrix Care and our whole portfolio across ResMed, we've got a really interesting marathon to run. We just finished mile one, 25.2 to go, Naveen. Let's go get some more value. And <laughs> let's help some more customers and help some more persons. Absolutely, Meg. And this is this is what's exciting. I know this is the start of a new year as well. And as we sort of get reset, refreshed, um, you know, e even having a vision broader than, than the 250 million, which itself is, is, is large, but we have an opportunity to really impact and really, you know, save lives and, and give people sort of better outcomes. So thank you again, Meg. This has been outstanding. Thanks, Meg.